remains, it's Christine Calgary over here and today we're going to go through the list of the eight reasons why I would not return to South Africa after living in Canada for 20 years. Let's go! Reason number one. I think you all know what this one's going to be. It is safety. And I can tell you, oh, there is nothing that is more freeing to me as a woman than the idea that I can walk around at 10 o'clock at night in the inner city by myself and I'm not going to fear that someone is going to assault me or to do any harm to me. Like that is one of the most freeing things about living in Canada that I think you forget about once you've been living in South Africa for a long time. I, mean, I don't have to go and tuck my purse onto my body or under my seat while I'm driving for fear of a hijacking. I can just put it next to me and my baby she's safe in the seat just behind me it's such a freeing thing as a woman and i think when you've been living in south africa for a really long time you forget what it's like to not live with a fear <sighs> reason number two that is going to be ease of mobility. And there's two components to that. The first one is just the ease of being able to move around. Uh, that's kind of also part of the safety umbrella that we spoke about before. But then there's this other component. And that's the idea that employability or being employed in Canada is far easier to do than it is in South Africa. And because it's easier to be employed, if you're stuck with a crap boss, you don't have to keep working for them forever. And part of that as well, that's an added component compared to the US, is that your health insurance isn't tied to you being employed. So that means that fear of like, oh my gosh, if we go through a medical crisis for a long time, I'm unemployed, what will that mean for me and my family? That same situation doesn't apply. I mean, like optometry and dentistry work, that's not included. But if you are in a car accident, it doesn't matter where you are in Canada, the medical staff the hospitals, they will help you out whether you are employed or not. And that just feeds to a greater sense of less stress in your life and also not a fear of having your rights abused just so that you can hold on to a job. Reason number three, hard work equals results. I think that Canada, even more than the US, is a land of opportunity. And I think that if you are willing to work hard, you are willing to retrain. If you're willing to work hard and learn and go for more opportunities, they will eventually come and it will eventually translate. Having tenacity means something. When I compare this to the US, there a lot of times it's very expensive to get an education. That's often a barrier to entry to get into a higher position versus in Canada, it's less expensive to get post-secondary education. And I really think it is attainable for a lot of people. I'm not saying that it's not for everyone, but I think there's more opportunity to improve because of that reason. Reason number four, Canada is a land of opportunity. So I grew up with a very humble upbringing and I did not expect my parents to pay for any of my degrees. And I'm very grateful because I was able to go through my high school experience and actually get some grants and scholarships to pay for my degrees. And it's not like I was some super genius. I just worked really hard uh, and did well at school. And I was able to get into university and have a lot of it paid for. And that's what I mean is wonderful about Canada. If you are the type of person who has the abilities, but not the resources, the lack of resources, they're not gonna hold you back. There are opportunities built into the system to help pay for things, to make sure that you're not stuck at the level of what you can afford for the rest of your life, but rather at the ability of how far you grow yourself. And yes, for sure, there's some people are still out of reach being able to do that. But for me, it was just so incredible that I paid for all of my post-secondary education by myself. Yes, I did stay at home with my parents for a few years and they paid for my room and board for some of my degrees, but I was able to pay for all my books and all my tuition through grants and through scholarships and through work study opportunities. And I ended up with only $7,000 in debt and I was able to pay that off within six months of having my first job. Reason number five is long-term prospects. 
So I work in the arts and media here in Canada. That type of work is often project-based and short-term contracts. I think a lot of South Africans are stuck studying something that is not in their passion or that they're not that interested in because the entire focus of your degree is to get a job so that you can have a decent life. Even that I know is from a place of absolute privilege being able to do that because there are people in South Africa who have this cycle of poverty that they can never escape out, no matter how hard they work, no matter how hard they try or how many jobs they apply for. So I know that I'm speaking from a place of privilege. I'm speaking from a place of white privilege, to be honest. As a mom, long-term prospects is something that's always on my mind. And it's such a great system here in Canada and in your various provinces that are built to help you and your family get ahead. So for instance, when my daughter was born, uh, we were able to start a registered savings account in her name for her post-secondary education. So for every $500 that we put in, the government would match 50% of that for a total of $750 that we could save per year every year up to the age of 18 so that she can use that amount towards her post-secondary education, which is just incredible that that's the system in there that the government wants to incentivize you to save for your own education but not just in words but through actual actions and policies and to me that is just so huge for being able to eventually have my child have a post-secondary education uh, and not have the burden of debt this leads me to point number six canada's robust social service system so Let's get into details. Canada has a really robust EI program, employment insurance. If you have enough hours on the system, which is in most cases 420 hours of insurable employment, that's through an employer, and for circumstances outside of your control, you were let go, you have 14 to 45 weeks available to help you get by with approximately 55% of your wages. So this is not a huge amount, you're not going to get rich off it, but it is enough to help you get by. And because honestly, nobody wants to be on EI. It's a good thing to know that you can fall back on in case you do need that help. And point number seven is Canada's healthcare system. So if you are in a time of need and you become physically ill, the Canadian healthcare system will be there to help look after you. It is not a free system. It is a socialized system, which means all Canadians pay into their taxes and that is what pays for the healthcare system. And I wanna talk a little bit about this because there are some components of healthcare that are not included, which are unfortunate and they are prohibitive for people. So I'll honestly speak about that. Your optometry care, anything with your eyes and glasses, that is not covered. However, if you have cataracts, that will be covered through an operation. I, I'm sure there are other examples as well, but that's just the personal one that I'm speaking from. Uh, dentistry care, that is not covered, <laughs> which is kind of ridiculous because who in their right mind can exist comfortably in life without good oral health. That is often taken care of through work benefits, but that is truthfully, if you are an independent contractor and you do not pay into a, a plan, it will be you can still pay for your dentistry, but it is more expensive. And then the third thing that is not covered is for the most part, pharmaceutical drugs. There are some cases, which it is, if you had an operation uh, and it's drugs that are administered through a particular special program, like a transplant or maybe even cancer, some of those things may be covered, but I can't speak to the specifics of that because I haven't been through those situations myself, but I have friends and family who have, and they have spoken to me honestly about what is included and what isn't. But I wanted to paint the picture for people to truly understand what is covered by the healthcare program and what is not. I will also say, I hear, I read a lot of articles about people saying how terrible some of the weights are for things and how difficult that is. And some of you have even written in asking, can you explain it a bit more? So let me talk you through some things that are covered in an emergency situation. That is a true emergency situation where your life is potentially in danger. You will go to a hospital, they will go through triage, which means they actually look to see if your life is in danger uh, and they have a nurse assess you. And then you will be admitted on the level of 
critical nature of the situation. And that is covered under the healthcare system. Operations. Uh, for instance, we've had family that has had a transplant. Yes, it took a long time because transplants do take a long time, but that was covered under the healthcare system. Cancer and treatment for cancer, that was covered under the healthcare system. A stroke, a heart attack, Again, you start to get a sense of that. And I am obviously speaking from anecdotal experience as in a storytelling experience rather from a statistical experience. But in all of those cases, the critical nature of the situation was assessed and it was responded to in a timely fashion. For instance, if you are giving birth, that is going to be something that takes priority. Um, if you are earlier in your pregnancy and for instance, they can't do anything for the baby early on if it's too early, that is gonna be a lower priority. Obviously, if you are in actual danger in your life, it's gonna be a high priority. Uh, but I've read such varied responses and different forums about that, that I wanted to clarify with some stories of myself and experiences that we've had with our family to give a sense of what is covered and what is not. And then sometimes when you hear things like, oh, I have to wait so long to see a chiropractor, that isn't covered usually. That isn't a third party expense. When I go for massages, that is covered under um, my husband's work um, it benefits, but it isn't a necessity unless a doctor has put it through the system somehow and you are in a place of need. I hope that adds a little bit more context. So, okay, on to the last point today, and that is the Canadian passport. Oh, it is so nice to travel on that thing, let me tell you. Um, you have access to traveling in Europe in the Schlegen, Schle Schlegen, Schlegen area. With a Canadian passport, you're able to travel to 26 European countries without a visa for up to 90 days. Uh, I think there's been some talks that you might have to pay in like a small amount to be able to go in advance and that's had people very upset. But as of for now, uh, the case is the Canadian passport is a beautiful to travel on. And I can tell you when I was younger and I traveled to Europe under a South African passport, the absolute agony that it was to get the documents to be able to travel versus the Canadian one where they just waved me in. It's just such a dream to travel on that passport. Oh my gosh. All right. That is everything for today. I hope you enjoyed this list. Let me know if there's anything that I left out. If you've been living in Canada or other parts of Canadian life that you're interested in and make sure that you subscribe. I put out a video on a pretty regular basis. And if you are interested in my day-to-day -day life here in Calgary, you can follow along on Instagram at Christy in Calgary. See you in the next